Well, it is my honor to introduce Dr. Fei-Fei Li. She is the Sequoia Professor of Computer Science at Stanford University, Denning Co-Director of the Stanford Institute of Human-Centered AI, HAI, if you all have heard of that. Um, her research includes cognitively inspired AI, machine learning, deep learning, computer vision, and AI combined with healthcare. Before co-founding HAI, she served as director of Stanford's AI lab during her Stanford sabbatical from 2017 to 2018. Dr. Lee was vice president at Google and chief scientist of AIML at Google Cloud. In fact, prior to joining Stanford, Dr. Lee was a faculty at Princeton University and University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. She's also co-founder and chairperson of the board of the national nonprofit called AI for All, focusing on training diverse K through 12 students of underprivileged communities to become tomorrow's AI leaders, which is a fantastic program if you're not aware of that. Dr. Lee serves on National AI Research Resource Task Force commissioned by Congress and the White House and is an elected member of National Academy of American or of Engineering, National Academy of Medicine, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Sciences. She holds a bachelor's degree in physics from Princeton with high honors and PhD degree in electrical engineering from California Institute of Technology. So I think it's amazing the influence that Fei-Fei and her research has had on the computer vision and machine learning um, scientific community, and we're thrilled to have Fei-Fei here as our first keynote of the day. Um, this is going to be an amazing one. So Fei-Fei, welcome, and we look forward to your talk. Uh, it's quite an honor to be here. Uh, very happy to be meeting so many uh, machine learning uh, researchers and uh, people in the community. So I'll, I'll just get going. I, I hope this talk is just an opportunity for me to share with you a little bit of an overview of what has happened in the field of computer vision and uh, uh, going to um, uh, embody AI in the past uh, quite a few years uh, from my perspective. So let me just begin with bringing us back to history. And when I say history, I meant 540 million years ago. So a little bit far. Uh, what happened then? Well, uh, life was pretty chill. There are some animals in the primordial waters of Earth. And uh, that was about it. You know, simple animals, not too many of them in terms of the, num uh, num the kinds. And then something really mysterious happened between a very short geological time, 10 million years, 540 million to 530 million years ago, the number of species in the animal kingdom just exploded to the point that from fossil studies, zoologists caused this the big bang of evolution or Cambrian explosion. So what happened? What is the theory behind it? Is it climate change? Is it chemical changes in the water component or anything else? One of the leading theory of this Cambrian explosion is from uh, Andrew Parker. He's a zoologist and he said that he, he conjectured the a Cambrian explosion is triggered by the sudden evolution of vision, which set off an evolutionary arms race where animals either evolved or died. Basically, he say, say vision brought the explosion of species and as animals evolve, the most important thing they involved in addition to their body is their minds, is the nervous system. And to fast forward 540 million years later, the entire animal species, with a few exceptions, are, are, have evolved with all kinds of animals, but they all have pretty powerful visual system, especially humans. We use vision to not only survive, but we use vision to socialize, to navigate, to manipulate, to entertain, to communicate, to create, and many, many things. It's fair to say visual intelligence is a cornerstone of intelligence, whether it's for um, humans or beyond. 
But the history of computer vision didn't begin 540 million years ago. It's a little shorter. Um, urban, legends, uh, urban legend says about 60 years ago, uh, an ambitious MIT professor decided that you know AI as a field was quasi-born. At least the, the term AI was coined by the Dartmouth uh, uh, um, workshop uh, group, especially Professor uh, John McCarthy, and uh, let's just solve vision. Moreover, let's solve vision in one summer. And vision is so simple, let's just get undergrads to solve vision. So that was the MIT project. The summer vision project is an attempt to use our summer workers effectively in construction of a significant part of visual system. Well, you all know as AI researchers in the audience, that vision is still not fully solved. In fact, it's a very, very intricate um, system, both in our brain as well as for machines. But we've made really incredible progress, especially in the past few, uh, uh, past decade, whether we're looking at the vision that's behind self-driving car, the fundamental progress in visual recognition, or all the generative AI that's related to pixels. So, the rest of this talk is really a little bit about where have we come from and where are we heading into. And I'll try to organize this in three uh, topics. Building AI to see what humans see, building AI to see what humans don't see, and building AI to see what humans wanna see or do. Um, clearly, there's just so many things to cover. I'll just give you highlights of some projects that, uh, that I think uh, are, um, you know, can thread together these topics. Humans, like I said, are incredible visual animals. We've got cognitive scientists and neuroscientists telling us that we process complex uh, visual signals really fast. For example, 20 years ago, um, uh, a group of French scientists told us that uh, our brain is capable of differentiating complex pictures of animals versus no animals. And these are examples. They're, you know, insects, birds, reptiles, mammals, and all that uh, from non-animals in about 150 milliseconds since the start of this uh, signal. I know for um, transistors, this is not very fast, but for the wetware, this is actually extremely fast. Not only we're really good at fast at recognizing complex things, we also have neural correlates. It turns out, when things are important enough, like objects, like faces or places, brain, there are neural correlates in our brain that's functionally devoted to these tasks. So one of the most important lessons that neuroscience and cognitive science have taught us in the, um, in the second half of last century is that object recognition for visual intelligence can be a fundamental building block. In other words, for us computer vision researchers, this is an important North Star to chase. So, and uh, for those of you who don't come from the world of uh, computer vision, you probably feel object recognition, you know, telling animals from non-animals, seeing there's a chair, seeing there's a person, whatever, it seems so simple because it is for brain, you know, after all this evolution. But it's actually mathematically a really complex uh, question because for any object we want to recognize on our retina or in a photo for computers, it is actually fundamentally, you know, there's infinite, mathematically infinite numbers to render a 3D object under different lighting, texture, background view, camera viewing angle, and all sorts of things. So that's a very hard task. So how did the field go about it? I would say that the field went through three stages of tackling this North Star problem of object recognition. One stage, the first, the first wave of attempt, I call it hand design features and hand design models. These are incredibly well thought uh, out mathematical uh, uh, models, whether it's geometric configuration and texture representation or shape representation. But the bottom line is, that's where we began. That was in the 90s, 70s, 80s, and uh, it's beautiful mathematical theory, but it didn't work. Um, then there's a flurry of efforts at the turn of the century or the first 10 years of the century. And I think that actually 
you know, most people, especially for the young ones here, you've never heard of these models, whether it's back of words models, Bayesian net, uh, CRF, or random forest, ADA boost, SVM, and all that. But the bottom line is our field discovered a very important tool um, is uh, machine learning is combining statistical modeling with computer programming and we're starting to learn what these models are we still have to hand design features and that turned out to be a dead end but we start to bring learning into uh, visual intelligence another thing that's happening concurrently with this very prolific period of time is data is internet internet happened when internet happened data happened uh, for the field of visual recognition, devices also start to happen. So we start to see the power of using data to benchmark our work. And one of the most prominent work was uh, Europe's uh, effort, Pascal VOC. The whole field for quite a long time, like seven years, was focusing on learning about 20 object categories. Most of them are relevant to England, like beer bottles and cows. Um, but something is not quite right. And that's where um, my students and I start to think, because there is a really a scale discrepancy. And it's not just about the size, it's really about math, actually. Is that if we really want to generalize to the world of objects, we cannot be focusing on 20 object categories and a few thousand pictures. In fact, psychologists have conjectured back of envelope that humans, little humans by age six, recognize about 30,000 different uh, visual categories. And that's a lot of data to ingest. And that is just different from the scale that the data set we were working on. And long story short, we did come up with this project called ImageNet, as, as most of you have known. And the bottom line of ImageNet is not about just collecting pictures, is about a reset in the mindset of machine learning, is to put the data at the forefront of what, uh, what uh, machine learning is about and to drive generalization, to drive high capacity models, and to also put a stick on the ground that let's figure out the problem of object recognition, it's worth it as a North Star. Again, long story short, you all know that uh, what really came out of uh, ImageNet uh, was um, a family of uh, uh, algorithm called Neural Network, especially convolutional neural network at that time. It won the 2012 ImageNet challenge that was put out globally to invite all researchers to uh, work on this problem. And Jeff Hinton and his students uh, really just drove the error, uh, error down so much that um, it, it, you know, yeah. it made people call 2012 the year zero, depending on if you're a computer scientist or not, year zero or year one of uh, deep learning. And I was actually just in Toronto two weeks ago talking to Jeff about this history. It's really interesting to see how he saw this whole thing and how we saw it. And of course, the field of visual recognition has really blossomed uh, uh, um, using image that as the fundamental training data set as well as benchmark data set. We've got so many different architecture uh, built upon your network that has just really had a profound impact in the field of deep learning. But as a visual uh, computer vision scientist, recognizing an object in a scene is not the end of the road for visual intelligence. In fact, visual, visual intelligence is so much more complex. So for my lab, we start to go beyond visual intelligence, uh, to go beyond object uh, recognition. One of the very important problem is actually putting together the relationships between objects, not just identity of objects. And this is a project called um, the scene graph for visual relationship recognition. And here's just a way to visualize even a simple scene of a couple of people doing, you know, feeding each other wedding cake. Um, actually, uh, you can glean so much relationship between the, the, the kinds of objects within this, the relationship, the attributes of the object, and you could assemble a whole scene graph. This is what we did as a uh, new representation. And we did this huge data set uh, called uh, Visual Genome a few years ago. I've 
millions of objects and relationships and so on. And you can do things like visual re relationship prediction, such as person riding horse, person wearing hat. But more importantly, this is a compositional um, um, representation. So you can do zero shot learning like horse wearing hat because you'll never get enough data for this kind of relationship. But with compositional representation, you can do this kind of tasks and uh, another one person sitting on fire hydrant. Um, Another thing that we went beyond image data and object recognition, and just just frankly, this is a shock to me, because when I was a graduate student at Caltech around 2003, 2004, I thought my entire life stream as a um, computer vision scientist is to get computers to tell a story in a scene. I really thought that would take 100 years, and I've got all my whole life figured out. But uh, less than 10 years later, my student, Andre Kapathy, Justin Johnson, we worked on this problem of combining language models. At that time, it was just LSTM and, uh, you know, precursor of transformer sequence to sequence models. Um, we combined language model with visual representation and was able to do automatic scene captioning and uh, uh, storytelling. And this is a whole series of papers. Uh, frankly, to this day, I still feel in awe of the nonlinear non -linear progress of our field. It's just incredible to see that we've sort of more or less uh, solved this problem in such a short period of time as soon as deep learning revolutions began. But there are still unsolved problems in visual recognition. For example, right now we're focusing very much on videos, especially the much more intricate understanding of multi-object, multi-actors, and what exactly they're doing in a dynamic scene in an ongoing basis. And this is a recent uh, NeurIPS publication and a series of papers uh, 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 focusing on what we call the MoMA problem of uh, activity understanding. And uh, that's something I think has tremendous um, downstream application implications. And once again, my, my field as object, uh, sorry, as uh, compare vision has brought progress so much. Some of these work are not my own, but I'm just so proud of my field. For example, the recent uh, working 3D vision from NERV to all these diffusion models and all that has been just incredibly uh, inspiring. And then, you know, on the human uh, modeling front, pose estimation as a major problem has made uh, huge progress, of course, uh, instance semantic, instance segmentation, as well as this kind of generative AI models um, has been, you know, just, just incredibly uh, successful. So the bottom line is that computer vision um, didn't take 540 million years, but in the past 60 years as a field, we've made so much progress, and it's just such an incredibly exciting period. Um, and we're starting to close the gap with humans, right? We're starting to build AI to see what humans has been able to see and can see for so many, you know, thousands and thousands of years. But the progress came from the convergence of data, uh, the, the, the neural network algorithm, as well as, which I didn't talk about, the compute, the more slow, the, the powerful chips that brought us the deep learning revolution in AI. But I still continue to believe that there is so much more to be done, especially if we continue to be uh, inspired um, by uh, cognitive science and, and brain science like we have been. And of course, so many students and collaborators have contributed to the work I've presented so far. Okay, so let's shift gears a little bit because uh, I just convinced you humans are super good. Um, and our goal in AI, at least one of the goals in AI, is to, to, to build computers to see what humans see. But are we really always good? Here is a visual illusion I want to show you, and some of you have seen this, so don't, don't call it out yet. In these two alternating images, they keep alternating, so one thing is changed in the scene. Just one thing is changed. Raise your hand if you see the change. It's an IQ test. No, just kidding. Um, okay, it's the engine. Okay, whoa, right? I'm not talking about one pixel. I'm talking a, about a huge part of the scene that absolutely have landed on your retina. I can guarantee that. Uh, yet, it's hard to see that. Well, um, it, it shows us humans have attentional deficit. We have blind spots. And this is a fun example. 
But when it comes to real life, it's not fun. Not seeing in real life can have dire consequences. Medical errors are the third leading causes of death. And uh, of course, medical errors come from all kinds of medical uh, scenarios. But one of them, for example, we all know surgical rooms has a lot of instruments and objects and tracking them is critical for the success of the surgery, especially what happens if you leave a small item in the patient body and you have to look for it. The surgery has to be stopped. Uh, on average, 45 minutes and above are, are, are spent um, when there is an unaccounted uh, small instrument or piece of glass or, or, or so on. And this is dangerous for our patients. And currently the technology is human checklist. And can we imagine computer vision can help, right? What if we have a pair of eyes from the, 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 the sensors to keep watching and keeping track. And this is an ongoing demo and um, pilot we're doing with Stanford Hospital on keeping track of uh, small items in the in surgical setting. And th this kind of technology help is really, really important. Okay, sometimes this, what I just showed you is not seeing unintentionally. You don't even know you didn't see it because there's an attentional deficit uh, in humans. Sometimes not seeing is more profound. This is another visual illusion. And this is my favorite visual illusion by MIT professor Ted Adelson. And if you look at the upper graph and look at checker point A and B, no matter what, how many times you've seen this or seen this or what I tell you, it's hard to believe A and B have exactly the same grayscale value. But then if you move your eye down here, and I prove to you with these two bars, you can see A and B have exactly the same grayscale value. You, you put all your attention there you want. It's still hard. Why? Think about it. Let me show you another visual illusion. Unfortunately, you have to be old enough to, to, to know this. Uh, who do you see? Clinton Gore, kind of, if you know who they are. Sammy knows who they are. <laughs> so, um, is it really Clinton Gore? It's, it's pretty much Clinton and Clinton. So what am I telling you? I'm telling you that whether it's this visual illusion or this, humans have biases. We see things through biases. We think through biases. And uh, again, visual illusion is fun. Real life examples are not fun. Computer scientist and poet uh, Joy Bunvini has beautifully captured the biases of human, uh, of computer visual, uh, um, computer vision algorithms in her poem, Anti a Woman. And the bottom line is this is really harmful for people, it's really harmful to our society, and AI as a technology can amplify human biases. And there's a lot of work, and I don't take credit for you know, any of this, a lot of work from you know, many of the Silicon Valley teams, academia, the entire fact community is working on uh, algorithm fairness, and this is really, really important. But here's another issue of algorithm, potential algorithm harm, is that sometimes not seeing is very important. Why? Privacy. Privacy is very important, and uh, I work in healthcare uh, um, applications, and I know that this, uh, this is part of human dignity, human respect, human self-respect. It is sometimes, actually, it's always more important than technology, but sometimes it's, it's you know, there is a tension between privacy and, and, uh, and help and, and treatment. Um, this is a very in complex issue, and I don't mean technology can solve it all, but as technologists, we should be keenly aware of this and also work in technological solutions. Just my own work in healthcare, uh, we have looked at using, you know, many measures, whether it's face blurring, dimensionality reduction, body masking, federated learning, homomorphic encryption, uh, differential privacy. Um, there's, I'm just not listing all the papers we have written, but I just want to show you 
one work that's not mine, but I really feel very fond of, I, I mildly participated. It's by Juan Carlos and his uh, collaborators on a combination of hardware and software approach. And the, the goal of this work is it's important to recognize human actions in healthcare or in security settings or whatever. But how do we preserve privacy while we recognize human actions? For example, you want to know what this baby is doing. But what if we don't want to reveal this baby at all? Can you, well, some of the previous work is blurring and all this, but can you imagine we distort the lens and then use software to recover the action? Without uh, without recovering the identity of the uh, of the person, and that's exactly this uh, prehar prehar project they did. That this is the lens, the the hardware that they they invented, and this and you can see through a a, a backend algorithm they can recover the activity of the person, and this is ground truth. So it's a really uh, very. Um, impressed by this kind of approach for the future where we can deliver value but protect human privacy. But the bottom line for this section is that we have to be careful what we're building. We're, we have to think about the values and sometimes we can build AI to help to see what we don't see. Uh, AI can introduce bias but AI can also fight bias. AI can be even better to deliver privacy computing when it's necessary, but we have to be very mindful of this. Otherwise, AI can also amplify and exacerbate the pro or profound issues that uh, humanity has always uh, prone to have. So we must commit to the study, forecast, and guide uh, AI's impact um, uh, on people and society, and in many cases, through multidisciplinary collaboration. And uh, I'm not going to belabor the acknowledgement, but some of our collaborators are doctors, clinicians, even legal scholars, and so on. OK, this brings me to the last part of uh, what I want to share is at the end of the day, uh, whether we're replicating human, we're going beyond human, we want to help human. This is technology can play a positive role in the society. And when it comes to AI, I know we're all AI nerds here, but really you go outside of this building and you talk to the public, you listen to the public. One of the biggest fear is labor. Um, you see that in the, 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 the news media, in the, in the uh, just public uh, discourse, and it's an important problem to talk about. And once again, just like privacy, I don't pretend uh, technology can solve all these problems. In fact, technology can have a lot of unintended consequences. But as technologists, we should devote to finding technological solutions that can be helpful. When it comes to labor, I live in a different world. I lived in the opposite world of uh, uh, machines replacing humans. I live in the world of human labor shortage. When I walk over to my colleagues at uh, Stanford uh, Medical Hospital, is that we need a lot of help in our medical profession. Um, America, as of this year, is short of at least one million nurses. As the society ages, we have a decreasing re ratio of caretakers to elderlies, and we talk about medical errors. There are not enough pairs of eyes to help to keep our patients safe and uh, catch the medical errors. So this is really the bottom line. If there's one slide you should walk away with today, it's this slide. AI is not meant for replacing human capabilities or replacing human dignity. It is really here to augment humans, and that's what we stand for. And that's what I, I really love uh, about uh, the, the research that we, we are committing to. So back to healthcare. There, I already said, there are many, many cases many spaces in healthcare that is just unilluminated. We call it in the dark. So what can we do? We have proposed uh, for the past decade an ambient intelligence technology for uh, using smart sensors and ML algorithms to glean health critical insights, whether you're in ER, surgical room, ICUs, senior homes, rehabilitation centers, and all this. Most of this work um, is summarized in a nature paper uh, we published a couple of years ago, but let me just give you a couple of uh, examples. One is uh, ICU patient monitoring. It turned out um, 
as you know, patients are fighting literally for life and death in ICUs. In America, 1% of GDP is used in ICUs. And turned out that if patients are mobilized with help, moved properly, it can help them to shorten their stay in ICU and recover faster. But how do you assess what does it mean the patients are moved? If the uh, doctor orders the patient should get out of bed twice a day, how do you know if they have gotten out of bed? How did they get out of bed? How do you even observe this? Right now, it's very hard to glean this information, but machine learning or computer vision is here to help, right? We work with Stanford Hospital as well as Utah's uh, Intermountain Hospital to put depth sensors in ICU rooms. Every orange dot is a depth sensor. And we can start observing human activities. Uh, things like getting out of bed, getting in bed, getting out of chair, getting in bed. Technically, these are multi-people um, recognition problems, activity recognition problems, and uh, and uh, our students have, you know, this is a paper we have published. Our uh, machine learning predict prediction uh, numbers are very good, uh, measured against uh, Guan Truth. And there's a lot more to be done here, but this is the beginning of that kind of technology showing the, the power. And this is 24 seven, it's cheap, it's not subject to human bias, and it helps with the human labor shortage problem. Another huge vast area of help that AI could offer in uh, healthcare is aging in place. Uh, it can help to predict and prevent unsafe events, monitor patients with mild symptoms, and manage chronic conditions, especially for elderly. And uh, I'm not going to belabor this, but you can imagine um, thermal sensors and visual sensors can help look at uh, watch for infection indications. We just showed mobility in ICU, the same with mobility at home. Sleep patterns are really important for a person's well-being as well as dietary patterns. These are all um, these are all areas of help that computer vision algorithm through ambient intelligence could uh, could offer. Eventually, here's my dream, is that we need help with robots. Whether it's humanoid or not, the, the form factor is not the key here. But we, as our uh, society continue to age, which is a good thing, it means the longevity is longer, our uh, caregivers' uh, ratio decreases, um, we need um, different forms of help. And this especially impacts women and people from an uh, um, underrepresented community because of the, the, the nature of the job. So eventually, we have to get to embody AI. This is really where my research is going. It's closing the loop between perception and action. 540 million years ago, when nature endowed that pinhole to the first trilobite, the point is not to sit there idle and catch food. The point is get the organism moving and really start to interact with the environment and close the loop. And that's where the technology is going. Well, speaking of this grand dream, this is more or less where we are with robotics today. Maybe it's a little better, but um, <laughs> this poor robot, right? Like we can talk the talk, but the truth, the, but the truth is, it's a, it's a very hard. It, it, we're still at the beginning of the robotic, uh, 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 robotic learning, um, um, you know, journey, and a lot of our own work. And this is including my own lab, right? We, we, we're, we're dreaming of dishwashing and and sweeping the floors and feeding food and and really doing all this. But really, we can just put a peg in the hole, or you know. Uh, open or close a drawer or um, or this. So one effort uh, we've been doing is how do we improve the, 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 the robotic learning? One dimension, this is just one dimension, is to go into the wild a little more than just the lab setting where there's a very close world of three objects or one object and, and there is just like a very close set of uh, instructions. So this is an attempt to do some robotic task in a more open world setting. Open, it's open set of language, open set of objects, and also better generalization. 
So this work is um, um, going to be pre uh, uh, presented at CORE as an oral this year, and it's called Vox Poser. And the idea is that in the typical uh, robotic setting, you give an instruction to this robotic arm, open the door, and then it trains a, a, a neural network, and then they turn out an action. But really, all this is to serve this purpose, generalization. So if you train, right now, if you train the robot with this kind of lab clean setting, it's very hard to imagine the robot can work in this kind of general setting. And, uh, and some of these settings are just, just, you know, cluttered, have different objects and so on. And uh, so how do we try to, you know, go from here to be a little more open uh, with, the, with the wildness of the real world? And the eventual result for this project is focusing on give you any instruction, give the robot any instruction, open vocabulary in the setting that is fairly realistic. And the robot's goal or the algorithm's goal is to create a motion planner that can um, execute this task. And notice this particular task, the robot not only has to uh, create a motion plan path to open the drawer, but it has to avoid the vase and all that. That's really the goal of this particular project. Um, of course, you we could just imagine dump a lot of data, but that's not realistic. We can we we don't have enough settings to train. So, what structure can we introduce to this problem that can take advantage of the advances of today's uh, AI and to give the, the the motion planner a boost? The bottom line of this project is uh, using large language models, using the visual language models, and to uh, do a co-generated 3D value map so that we can optimize for the planning. Um, I'll just quickly go through because I'm running out of time. But the idea is that you start with this human language instruction, open the door. You use LLMs, to your favorite LLMs, to generate uh, 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 you know, some Python code. And then you take visual language models to focus on the kind of objects that is, um, that is um, uh, uh, generated in this code and do a visual detection of the object, in this case, handle. And then once you have that, the goal here is you start to learn a visual motion planning map that is more um, that is more guided. So at the beginning, you initialize the, the path, you know, the whole, the whole thing could be your path. But as your language model and the, your visual language model guides you towards the goal, you start to, uh, you start to learn a different weight, basically, um, about how you should plan this math, uh, path. On top of that, you can also add, watch out for the VAS. This is another human language. Uh, but you can do the same. You can generate, uh, you can generate a uh, code, uh, a plan, and you can use visual language model to detect where the pa uh, the vase is, and then you can update your uh, your map, your your motion planning map, and then you can you can at this point. Let me just go here. At this point, you have you know you you have the target here. You, you want to increase the weight. You have the avoidance object here. You want to decrease the weight. All this is through the guidance of LLMs and VLMs. And then you combine a, a bunch of uh, more lower level uh, uh, robotic maps like rotation, gripper, and velocity. And then you get this. And all this is automatic. And we have, used, we have taken this to real robot setting and uh, successfully done, um, done this demonstration. And for this paper, we show you we can work on articulated objects. In, uh, these are all, uh, by the way, these are all zero-shot settings. Um, articulated objects, deformable objects, um, uh, other everyday objects, you know, whether it's toast or, or bread and, and all this, as well as, you know, online disturbance. So this is, um, I want to give a shout out concurrently. There is a paper that's probably more um, in, the, in the public eye, which is the Google RT2 paper. It, it is very similar. And we're very proud 
how much more generalization we have shown in, in our paper. Just a shout out to my students. Okay, let me just share with you one last project before I finish. Uh, I'm very excited by this. Having said all this, showing you the Vox Poser project, it's still frankly unsatisfying because compared to computer vision, um, most of these are still fairly lab generated, fairly you know contrived examples. One day we have to, in robotic learning, go beyond the small scale, um, um, arbitrarily picked set up by experimenters and the lack of standardization. Because if the dream is embody AI, the re it's for the real world. The real world is complex, dynamic, uncertain, largely diverse, interactive, social, and multitasking. So what we have already learned from NLP and computer vision is good training and benchmarking environments really go a long way for, um, for learning, for uh, AI. So can we imagine a North Star for robotic learning that is in diverse daily human activity. And this is our behavior project, a benchmark for everyday household activity in virtual interactive ecological environment. So that's, so um, here's a question. And this is an important question. You hear all the news about robots replacing us. And then we do a project like this. Where do we begin? What task do we even choose? So that when there's wild success, we are actually doing this socially responsibly. So let me just do a quick little test, right? What task would you like robot to help you? Don't worry about other people, just help you. For example, cleaning the kitchen floor. Does that sound good? Sort of, most of you? Anybody love cleaning the kitchen floor? It's like, no robots, I, it's all my own. Um, I don't know, California doesn't see this, but shoveling the snow, okay. Um, folding laundry. Yeah. <laughs> Graduate students love that. Cooking breakfast. Okay, this is getting a little dicey. Opening Christmas gift, <laughs> okay. Um, so this is the truth. Who are we to decide? How do we decide as computer scientists, researchers? Our approach is we ask people. We took data from government surveys, both America, Europe, and hopefully more than just America and Europe, about what people do in their daily lives. We take a subset of 2,000, 3,000 tasks. We hire 1,400 users um, trying to balance the, the diversity. I don't think we have fully achieved it, but we try very hard and actually ask them, how much would you benefit if a robot does this for you? It's really important how we ask the question, right? Like really respecting human dignity and uh, human agency. Long story short, there is a rank list, um, just like you guys, cleaning. Everybody wants robots to clean. But when it comes to opening Christmas gift or buying a ring, I guess that's important, um, you don't want robot to help. And that's what we do. We take the top 1,000 tasks that humans want robots help, and we focus on that. The rest is technical. We have to build environments. We scanned 50 real world environments from restaurants to office, to apartments, to, to uh, stores and all this. We are in continuous mode of acquiring assets and building object assets. These are realistic assets with many different uh, realistic properties, including articulation and interactivity. And then we build simulation environments. And I'm not gonna belabor how important this is. The fact is there are many very interesting efforts in simulation environments from Habitat to Sapien and, and, and all that. We partner with NVIDIA's Omniverse, and we're focusing on this behavior new environment called Omni Gibson that is realistic in its physics, um, like thermal transparency, you know, deformability and all this, in perception, so we do user studies on perception realism, as well as physical interactivity. And uh, in this paper we published last year at CORE, we do all these comparisons, quantitative comparisons of the advantage of behavior. I'm just not gonna belabor this. Right now in our lab, behavior, by the way, is partially released um, out of the 
a thousand activity, we have released hundreds of them. We're working on, you know, benchmarking today's robotic learning. We're working on just new algorithms. We're working on actually multi-sensory projects. So it's not just uh, uh, it's not just vision. We are working on haptic and, and other other sensors. We're also using this for brain uh, computer interface, as well as working with uh, uh, economists on social impact studies of household uh, robots. Uh, so one day, I do hope behavior will bring the kind of application that, uh, uh, application goal to to American household or everybody's household. And uh, this is the section where we're starting to imagine what AI can do to help us, whether it's a healthcare setting with ambient intelligence or robotic learning. It goes beyond what humans can do. It goes beyond what humans want to do. It goes into our relationship with the machines. And many people have uh, participated in this research. And with these three principles, which um, really guided our thinking in AI for the past years, let me just articulate, is the development of AI must be guided by concern for human impact. AI should strive to augment and enhance humans, not to replace humans. And AI technology can continue to be inspired by human intelligence and cognitive science. With these three principles, Stanford founded the Human Center AI Institute about four and a half years ago. And the one secret source I believe there is, and it's not just for Stanford, especially for public sector universities, is the interdisciplinary um, nature of this kind of effort. The faculty leadership is consisted of uh, computer scientists, linguists, neuroscientists, English professors, medical doctors, economists, uh, you know, political scientists, law scholars, philosophers. You can see with this kind of leadership, we really want to make sure that we are doing this interdisciplinary approach to bring human-centered AI. One of the labs we have is the Digital Economy Lab, where Professor Eric Brynowski actually collaborated with me on the robotic project and was looking is looking at AI's uh, societal impact in many different ways. You will be hearing from Percy and Chris Ray, and both of them are leaders of the Center for Research and Foundation Models. I don't know if Chris and Percy are here yet, um, but, uh, but uh, they have been the leader and doing fantastic benchmarking as well as uh, open source projects. And uh, we are the center that brought American University's first ethics and societal review in grant programs within, within the university. So where every AI grant program is subject to this ethics and society uh, review. And we're bringing embedded ethics into undergraduates and uh, graduate students uh, teaching because this is just so important for the future of AI. On top of that, we have been educating the public in addition to our students, especially uh, policymakers as well as business leaders. We are advocating a very important bill that's going through Congress. So if you have buddies in Congress, please talk to them. This is called the Create AI Act, which will create a national AI research cloud, a data repository for the public sector. And uh, I served on the planning committee for President Biden for this, but um, the actual bill right now is, in, is written by bipartisan, and it's in both House and Senate, and it's really crucial for America's uh, AI research ecosystem. So I, uh, I, I think this is my talk. I really want to share with you the, 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 the history and the future of what I see in computer vision and robotic learning through a human-centered approach. And last but not the least, I'm just going to use this platform for a very shameless plug that uh, my book is coming out in two weeks. <laughs> So, so um, you could order it on Amazon if you want. <laughs> so just in case you're interested. But thank you so much. Thank you, Fei-Fei. That was a, an amazing talk. We really appreciate it. We have time for a few questions. So if there are questions, um, let me get the mic over. There you go. Um, hi, very inspiring talk. So you mentioned all the difficulties of uh, robotic learning. Um, what do you think about just, uh, you know, like watch how humans do things? 
it's just like we train large language models, right? You just, uh, you know, just predict the next token. Just like, you know, for these human videos, you're just predicting, um, you know, like you could predict the next token of the image, right? And then essentially you can learn a human policy, right? So, you know, once you have a human policy, it should be easy task to sort of adapt to robots, right? Um, yeah. So I'm not going to dismiss that approach because I think imitation learning is, I mean, there's this multi-university uh, industry project called RTX by, uh, led by a whole bunch of people, probably some of them are in the room, um, and, uh, and then learning. But here's the thing. First of all, it's not just predict the pixels or next token or next frame. There is the physics, there's the dynamics, there is a lot, right? I understand you can learn dynamics through pixel prediction. But there is also just the question, is that enough? Is that efficient? Are there other ways, uh, you know, for example, I think simulation will play a huge role, a huge role in this. Um, that's just my prediction because uh, especially the fidelity of these simulation is getting so much better. The, 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 the gap between sim to real in my opinion, is closable with fewer amount of data if you do simulation well. I think you could combine that. Right? I think the key of this approach is you have a scaling law, right? It just keep scaling up if you, uh, you know, if you believe what Ilya says, uh, essentially you're just compressing the data, right? You, you basically will learn the optimum human policy and yeah, as you keep scaling. Yeah. That's, that's one philosophy. I'm not disagreeing. I, I think there is a mixture here we can use. All right, we got one more question. Hi, thank you. Uh, really appreciate this uh, great talk. Um, I'm actually very interested in, in combining this uh, state of art deep learning models with uh, or modeling the cognitive science or psychology, human activities, stuff like that. Also, my research, part of my research, is interested in this. So, with the current um, algorithms or models, do you think, you know, the large angle model is really powerful? Um, do you think um, it'll be more interesting to using the, for example, this uh, foundation models as the, a black box and the modeling some uh, human-like uh, activities outside from this model, for example, using as a reasoner, planner, and uh, doing something like that? Or do you think there are still a lot of limitations regarding these foundation models and we need to modify the architecture inside of the black box or open it, stuff like that? Um. It really depends on your goal. I think these foundation models as black box can go a long way in many applications, right? Like, you know, I mean, if I, again, the young audience, if you use applications like character.ai, nobody's opening that black box. Just, just, just use it. Not that I advocate for that, but, uh, but it depends on your goal. If you want to learn how human mind works, you have to, in fact, my, my colleagues, Dan Yemans, you know, uh, Surya Ganguly, um, are looking very closely at how humans actually do it. Mind you, the brain is operated on 20 watts. So I don't know how, you know, the current foundation model translate into, you know, the architecture translate into that kind of capability. There has been a lot of efforts, uh, including, you know, there's a whole interesting area of curiosity driven learning and all that. Uh, they're really trying to think architecturally um, how the brain works. Again, depends on your goal here. Hi, uh, thank you for the great talk. My question is a little broad. Um, I wanted to ask you, do you see any need for modeling human behaviors? Because when you say we, won't, we would like to do what the human wants to do, is it always clear what the human wants or do you see that we, we need to do some, 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 I don't know, some exploration, some human modeling, borrow something from economics. I'm just curious, do you see that we should go in, in this direction to trying to understand human, human and human behavior better and better? Um, my answer is depends on what you want. Imagine a self-driving car. Can you imagine a self-driving car doesn't care about human behavior? You come to an intersection, you don't care how humans behave. You don't care a baby stroller, how it goes goes around. If you see three kids playing with soccer ball on the curbside, 
I hope the car's prediction model would actually call a slowdown because kids like to send the ball in the middle of the road. That's an example, very strong example of absolutely you need to model human behavior. But there are um, situations where human behavior is not the center of the story. For example, I'm super excited by scientific discovery. You know, you don't need human behavior in protein folding. So, so it really depends on, on the end goal here. Um, thank you very much for, for, for this uh, wonderful talk. Um, you've talked a lot about uh, applications in healthcare and you know the importance of augmenting intelligence in that space. But as a professor at Stanford University, you must have thought also of how to augment intelligence in the domain of education. Can you tell us your thoughts about that? Yeah, this is how many hours do we have here? Um, I think one of the most profound thing that has happened to our society because of chat GPT or GPT-like technology is really about education. You know, there are two sides to this. On the application layer, superpowering teaching and learning through these large language models is just one of the most exciting area. We're seeing this uh, through through uh, the Silicon Valley you know, uh, industry effort, as well as research like Chris Peach and uh, Percy might be collaborating with him um, in, in superpowering capability. But I think there's something more profound than just superpowering learning and teaching. I think there is the fundamental question of what is learning in the age of large language models and large AI, strong AI capabilities? If a piece of software can pass all these standardized tests with reasonable scores, what are our children doing for 12 years or 16 years in our classroom where the end goal is to pass the same test? That's a very profound philosophical question for our society to grapple with, and I think there's no better moment no more age, uh, urgent moment than this to grapple with that because human capital is the most precious thing on earth. Two more questions and then we'll wrap up the question and answer. So you wanna go ahead. Thank you so much for such an inspiring presentation. So uh, uh, continued theme was definitely around uh, continually being inspired by cognitive science and neuroscience. So I was curious what specific advances in cognitive science or neuroscience you're following specifically for embodied AI. I'm not gonna cite my own work because a couple of years ago, I was collaborating with Dan Yemens on um, um, curiosity-driven um, learning especially these uh, self-supervision with the kind of rewards that's intrinsic motivation. And there we were simulating um, human agents or, or just simulating a baby. And as it explores the world, it learns self-motion first and then learning how to you know, pay attention, attend to objects and, and so on. I always thought that's a really, really exciting uh, line of work. Uh, but there's more than just what I'm doing. For example, Professor Mike uh, Frank and Dan Yemens are collaborating on these baby cam data. You know, they actually put cameras on baby's head and follow what they see and what they do and use that data to drive more uh, learning that way. So that's one line of cognitive work combining AI that I thought is uh, very interesting. We are doing more brain computer interface at this point, which uses EEG signal uh, from the human brain to drive behavior tasks. So that's a whole different uh, topic. All right, last question. Please stand okay. up. Um, thank you so much. I'm very inspired by your talk um, because I'm a humanist and I'm <laughs> studying history. And um, I do want to know more about like how interdisciplinary um, your projects are because it's not just about computer science or like machine learning but or like robots, but also like I, I saw some like um, Politi political scientists and also like lawyers, as you mentioned. So I just wonder, do you have any advice for like humanists or like social scientists? And um, how, I, I, I do want to know more details, like how do you communicate? Because I know like we have totally different world, uh, like words and also worldviews. Um, so I just want to know how do you work together for the same project? Thank you. 
Yeah, this is a big question. I'll just give you like really a 30 second answer. First of all, you have to have the will. Everything starts with will. So for, for our ambient intelligence healthcare, it literally took me two years to understand the language. And then a language of clinicians. So we start to realize, wow, we need not only clinicians, we need nurses, we need patients. And by the time we started that project in the hospital, we suddenly realized, oh my God, this is privacy related. We really need to, before we put any sensors in the rooms, we need to talk to uh, uh, legal scholars. We need to talk to bioethicists. We need to talk to uh, um, philosophers who are focusing on ethics. So we bring them in. Every one of those process is a challenge. To start with aligning calendars is a challenge. But, um, and then you learn each other's language, you learn how each discipline gets motivated. A JD student is different from a CS student, it's different from an MD, PhD. But really, I can stay here for hours and hours to tell you all the challenges. At the end of the day, it's the human will. You know, I've been on this journey for 12 years. It is not easy, but it's as rewarding as anything I can imagine, that kind of interdisciplinary approach. So just, just it's worth it. Thank you. All right. Thank you for an amazing and inspiring talk. Let's all thank Dr. Lee again.